Dear students, after learning about the typical thoracic vertebrae and ribs, let us look into the atypical thoracic vertebrae and ribs. You have learned the characteristic features of the typical thoracic vertebra, wherein you have found the costal facets two of which are seen on the body and one of it is seen on the transverse process. The facets on the body are the demi facets and one is superior nearer the superior border of the body on its lateral surface and the other one is the inferior towards the inferior border of the lateral surface of the body of typical thoracic vertebra. And the facet on the transverse process. So these three facets are for articulation with the corresponding facets on the typical rib. This is what you have learned in the previous class on thoracic vertebra and the ribs that are typical. Then what are the atypical thoracic vertebrae. So the atypical thoracic vertebrae are the first, ninth and tenth to twelfth thoracic vertebra. So they are the atypical vertebra and how they are atypical when compared to the typical thoracic vertebra. Let us learn a gist of it first. So the T1 vertebra it has got the superior costal facet which is not a demi facet. It is a full facet for articulation with the head of the first rib. Coming to the T9 thoracic vertebra. So it has got a single costal demi facet. The 10th thoracic vertebra has a single complete costal facet which is located partly on the body and partly on the pedicle. Coming to the 11th and 12th thoracic vertebrae, they have a single complete costal facet on the pedicle and they have no facet on transverse process. So this is in just about the features of atypical thoracic vertebrae. Now let us see the first thoracic vertebra. It has the body that resembles the cervical vertebra and the spine of it is thick and almost horizontal and it presents the superior vertebral notch which is well marked and if you see the facet on the lateral aspect in relation with the body there is the complete facet you are seeing and this is the demi facet and you can see the vertebral foramen and the body of it, the transverse processes and spine you are seeing. So, see the body of it. It will resemble that of the cervical vertebra and the superior vertebral arch which is well marked and the spine is thick and horizontal in the first thoracic vertebra. And let us see the other features of it. So it has got the costal facets. So superior is complete. The inferior is a demi facet. And you can see the body, the raised edges you can observe. After learning about the first thoracic vertebra, let us focus on the ninth thoracic vertebra. This is the lateral view of the body of the vertebra you are seeing and you are seeing only one demi facet. The lower demi facet is absent and this vertebra connects with only ninth rib and not with the tenth rib. And this is the facet on the transverse process of the ninth thoracic vertebra for a corresponding 
face it on the tubercles of the ninth rib. Then coming to the 10th to 12th thoracic vertebra, these will be resembling the lumbar vertebra in their shape, size of the vertebral bodies, vertebral foramina and spines and they have only one costal facet on each side of the body. So that is the specific feature for the 10th to 12th thoracic vertebrae. And let us go into some more details of the 10th to 12th thoracic vertebrae by following these images. If you observe the costal, costal facet, only one facet will be seen and on the body of the 10th thoracic vertebra and in the case of 11th and 12th thoracic vertebra, the single costal facet is encroaching onto the pedicles. So you can see it only on the body in relation with the 10th and encroaching onto the pedicles in the case of 11th and 12th thoracic vertebrae. And looking at the transverse process. So in the case of 10th, there is a large flat costal facet above the tip of transverse process. And in the case of 11th and 12th, the transverse processes, if you observe, the costal facets on the transverse processes are absent. In the case of 12th transverse process, it consists of three tubercles, superior, inferior and lateral tubercles will be seen on the transverse process of 12th thoracic vertebra. And if you look at the inferior articular facets, processes. So 11th one faces posterolaterally like the thoracic type and in the case of 12th it faces laterally like the lumbar type. So the inferior articular processes if you observe the 11th one. So it is directed posterolaterally like the thoracic type whereas in the 12th it will be facing laterally like the lumbar type. So the 12th thoracic vertebra is similar to lumbar vertebra and it has got a single costal facet and there is no facet on the transverse process. The inferior articular facets are of lumbar type while the superior facets are of thoracic type, the 12th thoracic vertebra. So after learning about the atypical thoracic vertebra, let us learn about the atypical ribs. And before we proceed with the atypical ribs, let us see what are the characteristic features which you have to recollect at this point of time about the typical rib. So the typical rib is curved along its whole extent and it is angulated presenting two curves, one 1.5 centimeters in front of the tubercle and the other 1.2 centimeters behind the anterior end and it is twisted at, at both ends and if you keep it on a horizontal surface, both ends cannot touch the horizontal surface. Now let us see what are all the atypical ribs. So that have the features that are not common with most of the ribs. The atypical ribs are the first, second, tenth to twelfth ribs. So, let us learn a gist about each of these atypical ribs. The first rib, if you take, it is shorter, wider and it has one facet for the first thoracic vertebra. So now recollect the complete facet on the lateral surface of the first thoracic vertebra. The second rib, it is longer than the first rib. 
and there is absence of twist in it. The tenth rib it has one facet for articulation with the tenth thoracic vertebra. Now recollect the tenth, eleventh, and twelfth thoracic vertebra with only one costal facet on their bodies. The eleventh and twelfth ribs they have one facet for articulation with numerically corresponding vertebra, and they don't have neck. So coming to the first rib. So it is the shortest, strongest, broadest, and most curved of all the two ribs. And its shaft it is not twisted because it presents only sharply curves, curved. The flattened from above downwards. That is the another feature of it. So shortest, strongest, broadest, and most curved of it with sharp curves, and there is no twist, and flattened from above downwards. To determine the side of it, the anterior end is thicker and larger, and it is pitted. The posterior end is small and rounded. So this is the vertebral end, and this is the sternal end of it, which comes in contact. With the first costal cartilage, through which it articulates with the manubrium sternae. The presenting parts, if you observe, the shaft has two surfaces: the upper surface and lower surface. Not the outer surface and the inner surface, as in typical rib. And if you see the borders, it has got outer border. And inner border. So when compared to typical ribs, which will be having an upper border and a lower border. So the anterior and posterior ends you could identify. The anterior end is thicker and larger than the other ribs. If you observe the posterior end, head is small and rounded. The neck is rounded and directed laterally. upwards and backwards the tubercle is large it coincides with the angle of the rib so the anterior end is thicker and larger than the other ribs posterior end if you observe the head is small and rounded neck is rounded and directed upwards backwards and laterally the tubercle is large and it uh, corresponds to the angle of the rib See the articulation of the posterior end of the first rib with the thoracic vertebra, and it has got. If you see the head of it, it has got single facet, and it articulates with the T1 vertebra. And if you see the tubercle, it is prominent and it coincides with the angle, and it articulates with the costal facet on the transverse process of the first thoracic vertebra. and if you observe the upper surface of the first rib it is marked by two shallow grooves separated by a ridge and the lower surface is smooth and it has got no costal groove and outer border is convex thick behind and thin in front the inner border is concave and presents an enlargement called the scalene tubercle so the upper surface is having two shallow grooves one for an artery and one for the vein which we will see a little later and it has got a the lower surface which is smooth and without a costal groove the outer border is convex thick behind and thin in front the inner border is concave and presents a tubercle called the scalene tubercle now observe the upper surface which has got the scalene tubercle and this is for the insertion of the scalenous anterior muscle and there is a groove in front of the scalene tubercle and in which it is related to the subclavian vein subclavian vein is lodged in this 
grew anterior to the scalene tubercle. And posterior to the scalene tubercle, there is a groove in which you will see the subclavian artery along with lower trunk of brachial plexus. And further details are in front of the groove for the subclavian vein, there is the attachment of the costoclavicular ligament. And behind the groove for subclavian artery, there is the attachment of the scalenous medius muscle. Scalenous medius muscle is inserted here. Then anterior end of first costal cartilage nearer it, you will find the origin of the subclavius muscle. So the upper surface presents a scalene tubercle for the insertion of the scalenous anterior muscle. The groove anterior tubercle lodges the subclavian vein, groove posterior to the tubercle lodges the subclavian artery along with lower trunk of brachial plexus. In front of the groove for subclavian vein is the insertion of the uh, attachment of the costoclavicular ligament and behind the groove for subclavian artery is the insertion of scalenous medius muscle. The anterior end near the costal cartilage is the origin of the subclavius muscle. And the lower surface will be in relation to the pleura and lungs. So if you observe the first strip, there is absence of angle, absence of twist and absence of costal groove. These are the points which you have to identify in relation with the first strip. If you observe the outer border of the first strip, this is the outer border and this is the inner border of it. If you observe the outer border of the first strip, here you are seeing the origin of the first digitation of serratus anterior and not only that, it gives origin to the intercostal muscles, external and internal intercostal muscles of first space. Then if you observe the inner border, it gives attachment to the suprapleural membrane. You can see the attachment of the suprapleural membrane. And coming to the anterior aspect of the neck, from medial to lateral, you will find the sympathetic trunk and then the first posterior intercostal vein, the superior intercostal artery, the ventral ramus of T1 spinal nerve that, that ascends across the rib to join the brachial plexus. So, the anterior aspect of neck contains the Sympathetic trunk, the first posterior intercostal vein, superior intercostal artery and T1 nerve from medial to lateral. So you will be seeing the, this is the anterior upper surface relations which we have already seen and along the neck you are seeing the tubercle, the costo transverse ligament attachment you are seeing here. So, this is only to show you the articulation of the first strip with the manubrium sterni. So, if, this is the first strip, this is the posterior vertebral end, and this is the upper surface, and this is the anterior end, this is the inner border, and this is the outer border of it. Coming to the second rib, this is thinner and twice longer than the first rib. The non-articular part of the tubercle is small in this rib. 
the angle is right and situated close to the tubercle the shaft is not twisted both ends will touch the horizontal surface and it has got the outer surface which is facing laterally and upwards and it gives attachment to the scalenus posterior and serratus posterior superior so you can see the scalenus posterior and serratus posterior superior getting inserted onto the outer surface and the origin of the first and second digitations of serratus anterior also you can see on the outer surface the inner surface is related to the pleura and lungs and if you observe the last three thoracic vertebrae they are lacking the facets on transverse processes and the ribs associated with them are also lacking the tubercles the articulation is solely between the head of the rib and the demi facet so the 11th and 12th ribs they are different from the 10th one the if you observe the 10th rib it is closely related to the typical rib it is shorter and it has single facet on head for articulation with the body of 10th thoracic vertebra coming to the 11th and 12th ribs they are short and have pointed ends neck and tubercles are absent in these ribs the costal groove and angle are poorly marked in the 11th rib and totally absent in the 12th rib and some more details of the 12th rib so if you see the attachments and relations of it the anterior rib it gives origin to the diaphragm and it gives attachment to the three layers of the thoracolumbar fascia that is the anterior middle and posterior layers of it and between the middle and posterior layers of thoracolumbar fascia is the insertion of the quadratus lumborum and it also gives attachment to the lateral arcuate ligament then coming to the posterior attachments if you see you can see the erector spinae insertion then the origin of the latissimus dorsi a strip to the latissimus dorsi is given by this rib and then to the external oblique muscle of abdomen the origin for the external oblique muscle of the abdomen then to a strip to the serratus posterior inferior muscle so the origins for the latissimus dorsi external oblique abdomen and the serratus posterior inferior muscles then insertion to the erector spinae muscles and to levator or costal lower part of it then it is related to the pleura that is the costo diaphragmatic pieces of pleura the other attachment is the lumbosacral ligament for the 12th rib so now you know the atypical ribs and the atypical thoracic vertebra in detail after learning about the atypical ribs let us consider about the supernumerary ribs which are seen in the lumbar region and in the cervical region if they are in the lumbar region that lumbar rib is known as the gorilla rib and it will grow from the costal element of the components of any of the lumbar vertebra most common being the l1 vertebra but in this picture you are seeing it coming from the fourth lumbar vertebra 
The lumbar rib is more common than the cervical rib, but it remains undiagnosed as it will not cause any symptoms and it can be mistaken for fracture of the transverse process of that comes in lumbar vertebra. The other supernumerary rib is the cervical rib and the cervical rib it grows from the costal element components of the C7 vertebra and the incidence of which is 0.2 to 0.5 percent. It can be unilateral or bilateral as you are seeing in this case it is bilateral and it is more common on the right side and it may have a blind tip or it can join with the first rib by fibrous band or cartilage or bone which you can see in this picture and it will compress the lower trunk of brachial plexus or subclavian artery. So what will be the symptoms of pressure effect of the cervical rib? So it, it shows its pressure effects on the lower trunk of the brachial plexus in which case there will be pain along the medial side of forearm and hand and if it shows its pressure on the subclavian artery it can be identified by what is known as Edson sign. There will be absence of radial pulse in the arm and abduction and external rotation of shoulder that is called Edson sign. So which is due to compression of the subclavian artery by the cervical rib in which case there will be absence of radial pulse in the arm or abduction and external rotation of shoulder. And if there is comp compression on the sympathetic chain, it can result in Horner syndrome where there will be pupillary constriction, drooping of eyelid and absence of sweating on the affected side. So, in this lecture, you have learned about the atypical vertebra, the atypical ribs and the supernumerary ribs.